Hello. Welcome back. We're so excited to see you. Officially, day one of registration has come to a close, and you guys did amazing. Amazing! Yay! We'll take a little bit of credit because we told you what to do, <laughs> but no. Um, we're really, really proud of you. Over 96% of you are actually in six, seven, or eight credits, which mm -hmm. is exactly where you need to be. Awesome. Um, if you're a little bit lower today or m maybe couldn't log in or couldn't get into your appointment, that's okay. Registration opens again tomorrow, so we get to have a little bit more fun tomorrow. Um, so we're going to start just by reminding everybody to check their registration times. They are not the same as your start time today. They will absolutely be at a different time, still Eastern Standard Time, um, but it is specified to you. We still have staggered starts, so people are starting at different times. Um, just as a reminder, you can check your start time in Opus. So log into Opus, click on the tile that says Course Enrollment and Planning, uh, and then click on the final link that says Enrollment Appointments, and you will now see a, a specific time for the 14th. Right. And remember, this one goes until Friday, this upcoming Friday, until at 3 p.m. Eastern. Yep. So you have all week to do some ads, some drops, and some swaps. Um, and just so you guys know, Michael and I um, can see a lot of the questions that are coming in in the live chat. We want to make sure we cover some things, some questions that have been coming in all day, um, but we will do our best to also answer your questions as they're coming in. And you also see we have some academic advisors in the chat, so they'll be answering questions as well um, throughout this afternoon. So thank you, academic advisors, for being here. So we want to review just a couple of things that came up today. Um, so one is related to the PACE course. A lot of you all noted that you tried to swap in and out of the PACE course. You weren't able to do so. We work with offices on campus to ensure that you're going to be able to do that starting tomorrow. So yeah. we resolve that issue for you. And half of you are already in a PACE section. That's great. We imagine that probably for both PACE and health, you're going to do a lot of swaps as other classes um, come open or as your schedule changes. So that's absolutely fine. By the end of this week, we just want you enrolled in a section. And if that needs to change when you come to campus um, or during ad drop swap, that is absolutely okay. Just do your best to enroll in at least one section of both. Um, so AP credit, transcripts, and previous credit has also come up today. Um, so for some of you all, it was related to an econ class. Um, and we're working with students on a case-by-case -case basis to resolve some of those issues. Um, but we also have questions related to transcripts and previous credits. you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so first off, a lot of you have submitted your scores. So good job. Um, we've, we've asked you to do that. Um, some of you have submitted your scores or you put a request on the college board or through IB. Um, and there might have been a little bit of delay between that actually coming into Emory. So if your scores have not yet posted, but you know you've made an official request, um, we're asking you to verify the date in which you actually submitted. So if you just made that request to AP or IB you know, three or four days ago, your scores are not going to get posted. If you made that request June 5th or July 5th, uh, they should be posted right now. So continue, continue to send in those questions to us. We are working with students as quickly as possible and with the Office of Admission. Um, if you specifically know that you have sent something in at an earlier deadline, you can email admission.processing at emory.edu. Please make sure you include your full official Emory name and your student ID number, and so they can look you up more quickly and efficiently. Um, one of the other things that's come up is related to the waitlist. Okay. Um, and so really understanding what your option is related to the waitlist. Yeah, um, and I know some of your pre-registration guides have gone over this, but we'll say this again. The waitlist is probably the last thing that you're going to do with registration. We really want you to focus on enrolling in open classes right now. So those are those courses with green circles. Um, when you put yourself on a wait list, you are not enrolled in the course. So that is not counting towards your 19 credits, and there is no guarantee that you're going to get off the wait list. So I, and we mentioned this before, you could be stuck at number one forever. You could be number 50 and get off the wait list. So it's really, really important that you get enrolled in actual courses. Um, once you're enrolled in courses, if there's something in which you would like to swap, um, but there's a wait list for that course, then you can pick the class that you're enrolled in, try to swap, and add into the wait list from that swap screen. That's really important because then Opus knows, oh, I want the wait list class instead of the one I'm enrolled in, I'll make the swap. If you add yourself to a wait list first, and then you create something like a course conflict or too many credits, 
you haven't set it up correctly and the waitlist is going to slip over you. So I know that that's confusing. You guys will figure it out. You're faster than we are with the technology, <laughs> but hopefully that explains a little bit. Waitlist should be the very last thing that you're doing after you have a pretty good schedule. Any other tips that you want to share kind of going into this next enrollment period? Yeah. So um, as you all know now, enrollments can be tight for certain sections. I think a lot of you have learned that the first year seminars are very popular, right? They are always capped at 18 students. And so um, as of now, almost uh, 650 or 70, 675 of you are in a seminar. Only 50% of the class is going to take a seminar this fall. So there still are about 100 spots purely open right now. Um, and so I would just keep an open mind and, and look for that. If you don't get into a seminar tomorrow or this week, um, you can always keep your eye out uh, during Add Drop Swap. And if you don't get into one this fall, that's okay. You'll take it in the spring. Um, there will still be some movement in first year seminars because people might try it out. Um, this is a reminder that you're only allowed to enroll in one seminar. So if by chance Opus let you enroll in two, uh, we will be emailing you. So please swap out of that. <laughs> Um, other thoughts for tomorrow, again, you should still have lots of options in your shopping cart. Um, it might not be your ideal time of the section, but for, for our big classes like biology, chemistry, econ, you should be okay with those registrations. Um, we also know, and we mentioned this a lot last night, that there are some classes offered every single semester. So if you don't get in, in this first enrollment appointment or even during add drop swap because a lot of movements like the butterfly effect happens during add drop swap um, you will have an opportunity to enroll in a lot of those classes in the spring so uh, keeping your shopping cart full um, continuing to add things and search um, the other cool thing that you can start using tomorrow is the ger search so when you're in opus it's a tile right in the middle of your screen that says ger slash gep search uh, and that actually will give you a list of courses that fulfill a specific GER, for example, FSEM, or First Year Writing, or HSC. Um, and it'll tell you all of the courses that are offered this semester and how many seats in real time are actually open. So now's the chance for you to use that really cool tool. Um, so if you're looking to say, oh, I could pick up a half now, or what seminars are still open, that's going to be a really, really valuable tool. My final tip is that, again, this is still the beginning of registration. So although tomorrow is the start of day two, um, you still have four days this week. We're talking real time now, so things are going to change in real time. And then you're still going to have another opportunity to go into registration August 27th and 28th. And then an entire week, the first week of classes, August 29th through September 5th. So this is a process. We are in it for the long haul. Um, but you guys have done just such a great job so far. We're really, really proud of you. Um, and your questions have been good. And the things sure. that you're bringing to our attention are the right things to bring to our attention. So we really, really appreciate that, too. Um, so just some questions about, so I have these options, but really nothing is working out. So what's, what's the best route for me to take? Yeah, that's always kind of hard to. Um, I would say maybe using that GER search is probably a really good option too because there might be some other classes at that 100 and 200 level that you weren't considering and you go, oh, all right, let me read about this in the course atlas and add that in too. I will also say stay calm. Um, sometimes it's looking at other sections of something that you're already in because maybe swapping, I'll use Econ as an example. There are multiple sections of Econ 101 Maybe you really wanted that 10 a.m. section, but you could potentially swap to a 1 p.m. section, and that opens up a lot of time in your schedule. So don't get, we've said this a lot, don't get too tied down or too attached to any one course, but that also means to any one section. Um, so there could be some movement in that too. Uh, and then just keep logging into Opus. I know you all have jobs and it's summer vacation, and maybe you're at the beach or other things too. Um, but, you know, logging into Opus a few times a day and just checking to see what's open, you never know when one person drops something or swaps right. um, what's going to open up in real time. And, there, and we know there's a lot of pressure on this first semester to try and make it perfect, but realize you have many more semesters after this. Um, and to definitely know that there's perspective and as you build your schedule, as you really understand what you're interested in and the classes you want to take, um, that having perspective on what the first semester means versus your remaining semesters is important. Right, absolutely. And I know this sounds so cliche, but we've heard this so many times. I've been at Emory 13 years now, 
So many of our students' favorite classes are those random ones because they didn't get into the thing that they absolutely wanted in the first semester. So it's a little serendipitous, but we'll go with it. Um, I love those stories as well. This is a great photo. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's my Emery Gold dress here today. Um, Questions are coming up about how many spots usually open for a course during ad drop swap. That's my same answer for waitlist. There is no way to anticipate that. So um, it could be that a lot of students say, nope, this no longer works for my schedule. It could be that nobody ever says that. So there's definitely no way to gain that system. You just have to be vigilant in, in your checking um, and being open to other things. Um, questions about PE courses. This actually hasn't come up yet. So in your first semester, you're all taking Health 100. That's more of an academic class, right? You're going into a classroom and you're learning how to set goals about your lifestyle and, and living your best healthy life. Um, because you're doing that and PACE, those are already two one-credit courses that you're adding on to your academics. I would say some people still fit in a PE, a PPF, or a PED in that first semester. But I think probably most people wait at least until spring um, or second year to get those started. So it is absolutely okay if you don't add a PE. Um, if I have any varsity athletes logged in, thank you, go Eagles, varsity athletes. Um, many of you will have an opportunity to actually enroll in your varsity sport. So please make sure you talk to your coach to get the enrollment numbers um, for that if that's an option for you. So question about if a, cl a closed course can still open up later, it depends on the course. So it depends on, um, obviously at drop swap, there's a lot of movement between courses. Um, so there is a likelihood that spots may open up, but it's also not guaranteed. Um, so continuing to watch it and to have an understanding of a full schedule, even if you're not able to get into that course, it's going to be important. Yeah. Um, and I see our advisors are answering a lot of these questions. So again, shout out to our advisors. Thanks to everybody behind the scenes doing that. Um, this is a, a good distinction about do your AP, IB, or previous college credits count towards your enrollment? So let me break that down a little bit. I got a few of those questions today via email. Anything that you're bringing into Emory already count as completed courses or completed credits. So if you're bringing in AP credits, IB credits, previous college credits, those have already posted. They do not count for what you're enrolling in this semester. So. Um, that's different. What you're enrolling in this semester is what you're going to take this semester. Um, you have until December to get in any AP, IB, or previous college credits. That also includes international exams. Although we are really pushing hard for you guys to get these scores posted now. Um, and a lot of you are doing that. Some of you are going to come in with more AP, IB, or previous college credits than we're going to allow you to post for credit. That's okay. You're going to have multiple years to make those swaps or decisions um, later if you want to remove credits. For now, all we care about is you getting them posted. Um, and you can make decisions about what you want for credit versus placement or if you want to remove things later on. It's too, too early in some cases to make that decision. The only exception would be for an English language or English lit. Um, because that will count for your first year writing, 100% you need to get those counted for credits. Everything else, I would say, it's probably an advising decision. But if you're going to bring in any AP English or AP Lit, you want those counting for credits. Is there a standard schedule that first-year students can follow? Uh, no, but there's a standard schedule you should not follow. So <laughs> I'll give you this little anecdote. Um, it's really going to depend on the classes that you're taking. Um, our most popular course times are 10 to 2. Who wouldn't want to schedule just yeah. 10 to 2? Um, but we know that lots of classes are offered early in the morning. Michael actually teaches PACE at 8 a.m. on Thursdays. Yes. See you there. Um, uh, and some classes even go into the evenings. We know a lot of labs are 6 to 9 to. Um, while it might sound fantastic to only have classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays, this is my, my warning, um, when it comes to midterm and final times, it is inevitable that all of your midterms, projects, or big things will be on the same day. Um, it also makes for a really long class day, and you might say, oh, I'll have a four-day weekend, or I'll do all of my homework on my off days. It just doesn't happen that way. So um, to the best of your ability, and if you have options, probably spreading things out that you take two to three courses a day, um, each day of the week, Monday through Friday, that's really important. 
I don't think anybody's going to get away with having no Friday classes. So sorry about that. We work on Fridays too, so right. we're happy to see you can always come by and see us too. Um, some questions about taking a continued writing course versus first year. So probably about half of the class is going to come in with first year writing um, credit, which is great. Um, and the other half is great as well. You'll take English 101, 181, or Complet sometime this year. Um, but the question is, are, am I ready to take a continued writing? So as a reminder, all of our students have to take three continued writings before they graduate. Um, what I really love about continued writing here at Emory is that they're across the disciplines. They are offered literally in every single subject. So you could have a continued writing in math. I mean, unheard of, right? Um, and so I would say if you really like to write and if there is a topic that you're interested in or a course at that 200 level probably, you could get started with a continued writing. It really depends on the balance of your other schedules um, and, and what you like to do. I would say probably about 10 to 15 percent of first year students take a continued writing in that first semester. Many others wait at least until spring or in the future. Um, but there'll be lots of opportunities to take continued writing. My best advice for continued writing is really liking the topic that you're signing up for because you're going to be writing a lot about it. So if it's just signing up because it fits your schedule and you want to get it out of the way, I'd probably advise against it. If it's some, a topic you're passionate about, you have the prerequisite, um, you want to learn more, a great reason to do a continued writing now. So one of the things that may be new for students in college is the option to take classes pass fail. Oh yeah. And so talking about what are some of the considerations about taking classes pass fail. Yeah. So at Emory, you will have an opportunity to take up to 20 credits pass fail. Pass fail at Emory is actually called SU. It's satisfactory, unsatisfactory. So let's just explain what that means first. Um, taking a class satisfactory, unsatisfactory means that if you successfully complete it, you will earn an S, a satisfactory and you will earn credits, um, but you will not have any grade associated with it. So whether you actually earn a D or an A+, plus, we don't have A pluses here, or an A, um, it all just comes in as an S. Uh, if you got a U, meaning you didn't pass that class, it would show up as a U, but in the same way, it would not affect your GPA. So um, the, the other side of, of these courses are taking it SU is that they will not fulfill a general education requirement. So all of your GERs actually need to be taken for a grade. Um, and most likely they will not fulfill a major or a minor requirement. There might be an exception for one course, but that depends on the major or minor. So for now, at the very beginning, I would say most first year students are not taking things um, SU or pass fail because you're figuring it out, you're trying to get GERs completed, you're not sure yet what your majors or minors would be. Um, and so that's my sense of it. Um, but if you know 100% that you are never going to major in a particular area, you've already completed a GER in that area, um, and this is totally purely for exploration, you could definitely sign up for a class SU. Um, some courses, when you're signing up for them, most of them actually automatically go to graded. And so you'll have to make that designation if you're going to change it to SU. Um, other classes like PACE are automatically SU. You don't get a grade for PACE. It's just the SWU. Um, upperclassmen. Oh, upperclassmen. So there's some questions about whether upperclassmen are registering. No, they are not. So we closed Add Drop Swap for all upperclassmen actually July 27th. That was to prepare for you. Um, again, we mentioned that some of the classes looked closed earlier in the summer, and that's because we were saving spots for first-year students. So this week, only the class of 2022 is registering. On August 27th and 28th, only the class of 2022 will be registering. So not until the first day of classes in Add Drop Swap, August 29th, will everybody be back in the mix. So it's just 1,443 of your closest friends for right now. Um, another question about work study has come up, and is it flexible with schedules, which may just be a conversation with the employer on campus? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you're going to have an opportunity to go to a work study fair. The, the really great thing about work study is that you are working at jobs on campus for people who know that you are students first. And so I think most people who um, have work study positions have worked with other students before. There are very many that are totally brand new to this. They understand that you might only have one or two hours a day to even clock in and clock out. Right. Um, and so I think they're flexible. But that'll be a decision that you have to make as well about whether it fits into your schedule. 
Um, and that might also help you decide which job to apply for or even take if you're offered multiple positions. Yeah, I drop swapped in very late times, like say 3 a.m. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So starting tomorrow, whenever your enrollment appointment opens, we are live 24 hours a day until Friday the 17th at 3 p.m. Uh, on the 27th and 28th, your appointment times are staggered, um, but they're open until the 28th at noon. And then for Ad Drop Swap, it opens up at 12:01, um, I think, on the 29th, and goes all the way to 11:59 p.m. on September 5th. So yeah, that's the beauty of enrolling in Opus, which is web-based. Everything is open um, for 24 hours at that point. But why are you up at 3 a.m.? Really? <laughs> Nothing good happens after 2 a.m. I promise you that. So we have a question about um, the college catalog and the course atlas. Why are some courses in the college catalog but not in the course atlas? Great question. Okay. So the college catalog is kind of our official record of um, what departments are, what the description of the department is, all the faculty who work in that department, and then a list of any possible class that the department could offer. So think of it kind of as your general catalog of what could be there. The atlas is actually what's in store this semester, right? And so this is, not every class is offered every semester, so the atlas is actually gonna give you information about this particular semester. Taking it one step further, Opus is actually really live to tell you what's open and closed. So the atlas, I know it's one extra step, won't won't tell you what's open or closed, it just gives you the descriptions of what's offered this semester. My advice is always to have the course atlas open kind of on one side of your screen, Opus open in another. As soon as you find something that looks interesting to you, put it in Opus, put it in your shopping cart, see if you can enroll in it. Um, the catalog, I would say, is um, really helpful as you're doing kind of four or five year planning, right? And so you can see things that might be offered. It will tell you if there are prerequisites. So if you're already knowing about an academic department in which you might major a minor in, you can kind of map out the courses that you might take or read descriptions at least about them to see, you know, do I want to take seven more classes in this area? I read the descriptions ago. I don't know. <laughs> um, so that, that's helpful. Um, another question about waitlist, why can't I waitlist in some class? So um, the departments themselves actually set up all the permission rules. They, they're the ones who set the class limits. They're the ones who set um, whether or not there are permission numbers. Not a lot of them have them. They're the ones who set the prerequisites, and they also are the ones that determine if a class has a waitlist or not. So there's not um, a systematic uh, way, not every class has to have a waitlist or uses it, and that's why some of them will have it and some will not. Um, that's also why just logging into Opus and checking to see if things open up is your best bet. Question about course syllabi when they're available. Um, it's dependent on the faculty member and, and when they're prepared to deliver that for the class. You will definitely get it the first day of class. Yeah. Um, and usually they will be also um, provided in Canvas, which you all have been working with in the essentials. Um, so hopefully if the professor has set up Canvas for the course, um, by the time the school year starts, the syllabus should be in there. But you'll definitely get it the first day of class. Yeah. I would say too, um, not now because still a lot of our faculty are out, but maybe when you come to campus during orientation, um, you could start emailing faculty just to see if they're willing to share their syllabi with you to see if that's something that you want um, or you're more interested in. Um, some of them will be more than willing to share with it. Some might say, sorry, it's only for students to enroll in my class. So that's actually really good just to know is that there isn't one single way you're going to communicate with faculty and there's not going to be one answer that all faculty are going to share. Same thing with should I email a professor if the class is closed or right. you know should I show up to class on the first day if I really want to get in. Um, the answer to both could be yes. Um, not right now but probably in the, in the next week or so or once you're here on campus. But know that the faculty might say, I'm sorry, we just don't have room for you, or please use Add Drop Swap or the waitlist. So each faculty member is going to be able to decide how they want to interact with you before you're enrolled in their class. So we have a pre-nursing question, which we don't get a whole lot of. Yes. Um, but um, information, one, is available on the Registration 101 website about nursing. 
Um, but if we want to answer this quick question about pre-nursing pre -nursing first semester. Yes, yeah, so I think it's about Nursing 101. Yes, if you are interested in going into the field of nursing or uh, our particular school of nursing, I think taking Nursing 101 is an awesome option. It is a one credit course. Because it's in the School of Nursing, it does not fulfill a college GER, but I still think it's worth it. Um, you will need a permission number for that, and in the PowerPoint that's uh, posted on the registration page for nursing, there is a link to the registrar, nursing registrar's email that you can ask for that. But 100%, I would say, take it if you can. We have a timeout right now, so we'll pick. <laughs> Tell some jokes. No, I'm just kidding. You can come in. Question about the Emory College Chemistry Prep. Um, so a lot of you all have been taking out of the course of the summer. Um, know that it is due by September the 5th, which is the end of ad drop swap if you're going to be in that course. And it's also um, a small percentage of the grade as well. Yeah. But the other question is, does biology have a, a placement uh, exam similar to that? Nope. Just chemistry. And remember that the chemistry prep is not a placement exam. Um, it's just getting everybody up to the same level, and so it does count actually for 3% of your grade, but it's not placing you into the class, so that's the difference for there. One other shout out about biology, if you are coming in with biology AP, IB, or previous credit from another institution, you will need to take the biology lab, 141 lab this fall, if you plan to continue with any other biology in the future, so you'll need to add that in. Um, if you only have 10 to 15 minutes to get from one class to another, a professor is leaning if you arrive two minutes late. Um, I think you need to lean on the side of making sure you're um, at class on time. Um, and so we kind of spoke to this yesterday that getting across campus is, is for the most part, not super difficult. Um, if you know you're going to be two to three minutes late, talk to your professor at the very beginning and say, hey, this is where I'm coming from. So if I'm a few minutes late or I'm out of breath, just wanted to let you know. Um, and sometimes they'll say, that's okay, no problem, or sometimes they'll say, I do an attendance quiz in the first 60 seconds, and if you're not there, that will count against you. I, I don't know that many of them do that. That's just a, a funny example, but you definitely want to talk to your faculty member. This is also a great way to introduce yourself to a faculty member. Um, we hear this all the time, that faculty are very lonely in their office hours <laughs> because you guys are super chatty online, but you actually don't go and visit them. So be a superstar in your first two weeks and just go say hi outside of class, too. You have to lots of gratitude points. I think we lost the connection for just a little bit there, but we seem like we're back on um, and we're still answering questions from you all. Why are all the Spanish 101s closed? Spanish is a very popular course, mm -hmm. um, and there are students that are getting into current students that have already registered for those courses. Mm -hmm. um, and so just know that up front, the Spanish, along with some other courses we've discussed, are very popular for students. Yeah. So for Spanish 101, if that's what you're waiting for and it is full, there might be a few spots that open up, um, or as people get placed into different ones, but that might be something that you have to take um, next year. A few other options for Spanish. It's offered in the summer here at Emory, which is pretty cool. Um, there are ways to get Spanish credit on study abroad programs. Everybody should study abroad. We'll talk about that later in pace. Um, it's also, listen, Spanish is awesome. I actually was a Spanish major myself. So if, if Spanish is what you love and what you want to learn, I, I don't want to take that away. But we have so many other cool language programs too and lots of other spaces. So if you're open and you really want to start a new language, um, and you're not 100% tied to Spanish 101, uh, check something else out, like Hindi, or Arabic, or Chinese. Um, all really cool things to learn. Um, so another question about when courses are offered. We talked a lot about um, that certain classes are offered every semester. We mentioned this last night as well. Our science courses in particular are sequenced courses, meaning there's a part one and a part two. The part one for all of our big science courses, Biology 141, Chemistry 150, Physics 141, are offered in the fall only or at Emory Summer School, meaning that you have to pay to come to Emory Summer School. So if you are not planning to start with Biology 141, Chemistry 150, or Physics 141 this fall, it means that you're either going to sign up and take it here at Emory Summer School over the summer, or you're going to wait and do them next fall. So there's not an option to start those sequences in the spring semester. 
The reason why is because all the great faculty who are teaching the first semester of those courses in the fall teach part two in the spring. Um, and that's to be able to cover the spread. So for now, no, um, no biology 141, chemistry 150, or physics 141 in the spring. Um, our language course is a big commitment. Uh, yeah, I think all of your courses are a big <laughs> commitment. But let's talk a little bit more about language, especially at a 100 level. Um, which are different than some of our upper level courses, which are more about literature and reading, to me, equally as big a commitment. Again, being a, a language major, um, think about reading Nietzsche in Spanish. It's hard and a big commitment. Um, so for your languages, a lot of times they're four or five credits. That means that they're meeting four or potentially five times a week. Um, I think language acquisition takes a lot of time and practice. Um, depends on how good you are at learning vocabulary, at learning rules. Um, you know, usually if you're pretty good at math, you're good at languages too. So that's a personal question about how, um, how you acquire language and how you study language in the past. Um, another really cool thing, um, we haven't talked about academic support a lot, but we have an amazing set of resources of academic support, including our EPASS peer tutoring program. Um, so we tutor um, peer tutors in over 65 subjects, um, a lot of them in those introductory languages as well. So. If you are nervous about starting a language, maybe that wasn't your favorite um, course in high school, there's lots of support available too. Uh, for, if you are looking for the number of credits for any course, I know the question here is about nursing. Um, that's just one credit for that seminar. But when you look into the course atlas and you click on any course, it's going to give you all the information you need. So it starts by the day or the days that the class meets the time, the location, the professor. If it fulfills a general education requirement, it'll tell you that three-letter that three letter code. Um, and then finally, the number of credits. And so you should never be surprised if something is one, two, three, four, five credits. Those are usually our, our numbers, um, how many credits things are. Um, so a question about what notification looks like if you have the opportunity to update with this. Yeah. You get an email, if you already want to come and enroll in the class. I think you're automatically enrolled in the class. I'm not aware that actually OPA sends you an email about that. So that's a good question. And for anybody who gets off the wait list, post that answer on Facebook. That would be really good. Michael and I actually didn't go to Emory, and so we right. have never registered for a class. But that's a really good question, and you just stumped me. So. Any of the advisors out there, if you know and you want to answer that, that's really great. Otherwise, we will look that up for you and um, post it on Facebook later. Um, great question. I like this question. Do I start, if I have to take both my first year seminar and the first year writing, which one do I start with? So um, I'll start by saying if you have to take both, which about half of you do have to take both, um, I typically recommend maybe splitting it up because they're both really small classes, so it ensures that you have kind of a, at least one small class in the fall and the spring. Um, it does not matter the order that you take them, so if you've gotten to a seminar this fall, great, and you can take the writing in the spring. If it so happens that you've got both into your seminar and your writing this fall, awesome. Uh, unless there's something else that you really want to take, I would probably keep it. Um, if it just worked out that you didn't get the sections that you needed or you, you're really focusing on some other GERs this fall, that's okay too. You'll just take both um, so six credits in the spring. So there isn't a blanket answer. Um, one of our colleagues here in pre-health always jokes that if you were ever to get a tattoo, it would say, it depends. <laughs> um, so a lot of the questions you guys are asking are really good questions, but the answer is probably going to be, it depends. So question again, is it more likely for a five credit language class to be harder than a three credit one? Harder is not the word that I would use. Um, again, these are different levels. Um, and the reason that courses are associated with credit numbers is based on contact hours, not on difficulty. So um, I'll use calculus for an example. I didn't do so well in calculus um, in high school and I knew not to take it in college. Um, and so no matter what, if it had been one credit or 17 credits, it would have been hard for me no matter what. Um, there were other classes that I just was really interested in and into, like art history. And, you know, again, if it had been one credit or five, I could have done great in it. So 
I wouldn't judge a course's difficulty in the number of credits. Um, it's really about the level. So again, you guys are looking at 100 and 200 level courses. Those are appropriate for you now. Um, and that you're in the right level. For languages in particular, that's about placement. So if you're starting from scratch, it's going to be 100, 100 101. Um, if you've taken or had any experience either as a heritage speaker or in a classroom, more likely than not, you're either going to take a placement exam or at least talk to the language coordinator in the department, and they're going to place you in the appropriate level. I will say, um, starting at the 200 level and definitely at the 300 levels, you're really thinking more about um, literature um, than just language acquisition. And so that's tough, even three credits. You think about you're writing papers in a different language, you're analyzing text in a different language, you're, you're going, having those conversations in a different language. So. Um, many of you excel at this naturally, some of you, it's hard. Um, another reminder that as first year students in your first semester, so you're all starting off, one, nobody has declared a major yet, you're all undeclared, you will all stay undeclared this fall. The other thing you all have in common is that you're limited to 19 credit hours. Um, 19 already sounds like a lot to me, but um, we do keep it at 19. Nobody's going over the 19. We want to let you ease in. We want to see how you're going to do. And you guys are going to do great. We know that you're going to do great. Um, if at the end of your fall term you have at least a 3.0, so not a 2.99 or a 2.98, but a 3.0, you could go up to 22 credits starting in the spring semester. This is based then on your cumulative GPA, and that gets evaluated at the end of every semester. Um, so for now, let's stick with the 19. Again, remembering that health and pace are one credit each, so that leaves you with about 17 credits for academic courses to play with. Um, our range is 16 to 19. That's what we've really been promoting as the sweet spot. You might end up with 15, that's okay. Um, I'm hoping that very few of you stick with the 12, 13, or 14. I do think that that's a little low, and that's unless there's a really specific reason that you need those few credits, um, I think 15 should really be your limit. Um, but there is going to be fluctuation depending on the courses that you pick for that 15 or 16 to 19. There's a question about what spring registration will look like. So you'll register for your spring courses in November. Mm -hmm. um, and then it'll mirror a similar model of registering for eight credits and then registering for the remainder of your schedule. And then obviously that drop swap period will be open to you as well. The cool thing about spring registration is what you're registering in November. So it's right before Thanksgiving. It'll be great topics around your Thanksgiving dinner table, so that what you got into. Um, but right after the Thanksgiving break, you actually have between November 26th and January, I don't know, 21st for ad drop swap. So this year you have a week, but starting in the in the winter, you have two months to play around with it. So when we tell you ad drop swap works, we promise you ad drop swap works. Um, there were some questions too, and I know our advisors are looking at this as well, about appropriate levels or 200 and 300 level courses with no prerequisites. So um, a little bit of a warning here, one and 200 levels are, are typically okay. Um, sometimes a 200 level class might still be pretty content rich and, and there could be a, a prerequisite, even if it's not required, that's good. So if you're worried about content or if you're not sure if you have the right background, you may absolutely email the, the instructor or the professor and say, I'm really interested in this. Do you think this is appropriate for a first year student? I will say most 300 level courses, even without prerequisites, are not appropriate for first year students. The exception for that is if you're placed like in a language. Um, but for now, let's stick to the one and 200s. You're gonna get to the three and 400 levels. We promise you. We had a specific question about physics that came up. So okay. for physics, can one take a lecture this fall on lab, either next spring or fall? No, that's a great question. So for all of our lab sciences, actually you need to take the lab within the same semester. Um, for a class like physics, 141 or 51, they're actually related courses. And so within those four credits, the lab is there. And so when you sign up in Opus, it won't let you sign up for the lecture without also signing up for the lab. Um, for our courses in biology and chemistry, the labs are actually separate courses, but you still need to sign up for those. If you do not complete the lab successfully in any of the science courses, even if you complete the lecture successfully, you will not be able to enroll in the next lecture lab series in those sequences. So um, important to take the labs in the same semester. 
Um, same thing as the lectures. The labs are not offered in the spring, so um, you have to wait a whole year to do that. But for physics in particular, they're related, so you do those together. So we're going to take just a couple more minutes for questions. Um, and so again, our advisors are answering questions. We'll be answering questions, and then we'll be on for just a little bit after the chat ends to wrap up questions as well. So uh, I'll call some of our Emory academic advisors out by name because you know these people as your pre-registration guide. So Frank Gartner, yay, hi, say hi, Frank. Thank you for all you've done for our international students. Mallory Joint and Pre-Health, yay, thank you so much for being on here and answering all those questions. Have I missed anybody? Hopefully all the ones that are out there, thank you so much for all your help. Yes, um, Kimber, Alice, Aileen, Elizabeth, anybody else who's out there, thank you, thank you, thank you. We really, really appreciate you. And for your students, I give a round of applause for your pre-registration guide. They have worked so, so hard. Hi, Frank. Um, <laughs> they've worked so hard to talk with you. I think we had over a 95% um, success rate of talking with a lot of you over the summer, and it's been just such a pleasure to get to know so many of you. You've all become really experts in Zoom, which is awesome. Um, Zoom is a, a technology that you will all have access to. You can make your own Zoom accounts now being at Emory. Um, so if you want to keep in touch with people right. when you're here, that's really good too. Um, final question that will take about waitlists. Um, so if you have a class you want to register for, it's waitlisted. It doesn't interfere with any other class time. We just register for that class as normal and the waitlist won't skip over you. What does that process look like? So if you add yourself to a waitlist right now and you have no conflicts, that's fine. But I cannot promise that you won't have a conflict in the future. And so that's what's really tricky about the waitlist. Um, if for whatever reason you've added yourself to a waitlist, and I think a lot of you have, and then eventually you enroll in an open course that conflicts with that waitlist course um, or it puts you at a number of credits that won't allow you to enroll in the waitlist, you're going to have to remove yourself from the original waitlist and then use the swap if or drop if function to add yourself back on. And you will lose your place on the waitlist, your original place. So um, it's tricky. The waitlist is tricky. That's why we usually say it's the last thing that you can do. But if you're like, nope, I don't plan to add anything in that time slot, you can add yourself to the waitlist at this time. Well, thank you all again so much for joining us. We really appreciate you all. Um, best of luck. You all did incredible today registering for classes. We know you're going to so continue proud. it yes. the rest of this week. Um, again, we'll be here for a couple minutes answering your questions, and then we'll be here. If you need to call us or email us this week, we'll be available for you as well. And remember your pre-registration guides. I'll say kind of one last thing just about the Emory Adv Advising Network. We're your first stop, right? Your pre-registration guides helped you get to today. I just can't thank them enough. They've done such a great job that you guys have registered in your classes already. Um, once you come to campus, you are gonna be talking to so many people. Your pre-major faculty advisor, faculty from all different departments, students who have literally been in your shoes before. So we really believe in this broader Emory Advising Network, um, and we see that you're using it and you're reaching out to different people. And so be proud of yourselves for that. I think that's a really important lesson to learn, and you're learning it early. Um, and we just are so excited to see you all in person right. in a little over two weeks. So, yay! It's coming soon. Yay, yay. See you all. Bye, everyone.